Good evening. Welcome to our Maundy Thursday worship service. This evening, the order of service is entirely printed out in the worship folder. And you will note that as we reach the end of the service, we will have a rite known as the stripping of the altar, in which a psalm will be sung, and we will take everything off of the altar in a solemn remembrance of how our Lord Jesus Christ was falsely accused, arrested, and condemned, and then taken to trial before Pontius Pilate. With that, may the Lord bless our worship. And of the Holy Spirit. Mandatum novum do wobis, which is to say, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus 
Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Dear friends, God invites us to come into his presence with humble and penitent hearts. Let us confess our sins to him and plead for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that my very nature is sinful and corrupt. I have not loved you with all my heart. In what I have done and left undone, I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy, O Lord. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, God forgives our sins and calls us from darkness to his marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Amen. O Lord, our God, you have poured out upon us your never-ending love by giving your Son, Jesus Christ, into death for us. Nourish your church through the sacrament of blood. Strengthen us that we may continue to proclaim the praises of him The Old Testament reading for Maundy Thursday is written in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, beginning at verse 21, the, the account of the Passover. When, then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord God will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. 
Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, beginning at verse 16, our sermon text for this evening. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we, who are many, are one body, for we all share the one loaf. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 14. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him. 
Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large, upper, large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the gospel of our Lord. What love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And through faith in your Lord Jesus Christ, that is who you are. Again, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, 
Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we, who are many, are one body, for we all share the one loaf. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in 63 B.C., the great rival of Julius Caesar, his name was Pompey, the great, he conquered the city of Jerusalem. And when he was told that he couldn't go in the temple area because he was not Jewish, well, that just didn't quite sit with him. Not only did he go into the temple complex, he marched right into the Holy of Holies. And Jewish people couldn't even go in there. Only one person, the Jewish high priest, on one day a year, but Pompey just walked in, and he looked around, and he was rather unimpressed. A big empty room with a stone floor. Where's God? Don't see God. The Romans mock the Jews and then later the Christians, for having that kind of God, a God with no statue, no picture, no description, invisible God. Where's God? Where is he? Where's your God? It sounds strikingly familiar to what Pharaoh said, right? As Moses told him to let God's people go, who's God? Where's this God? Why should I listen to him? But sometimes it's not just the unbelievers who want to know where God is. In the midst of earthly life, as we struggle with its disappointments and frustrations and pains and sufferings and shattered plans, sometimes in our weakness too we want to know where God is. Where is he? I want to see him. I want him to just show himself, appear to me here, and prove to me that he is real, and tell me that everything's going to be all right. This has been going on for centuries, even among God's people. The writer of Psalm 42, for example, said this, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? In his grace and in his wisdom, our Father in heaven has asked us, his children, to walk through this world by faith and not by sight. And yet, it was Jesus himself, after his resurrection, who showed up and told one of his doubting disciples, Blessed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus on this night told his disciples that soon they would not see him anymore because he was returning to the Father. And yet, when he did return to the Father, did he not lift his hands in blessing and tell them, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And brothers and sisters, as we gather here tonight in remembrance of him, may that very same blessing cheer our hearts and give us courage as we press on towards our heavenly goal. Surely Jesus is with us always in this meal that he has provided and in in this body to which you belong. Surely, he is with you always. And we need that assurance. We live in a crazy, mixed-up world, don't we? It just gets crazier every day. And, And the attacks on our faith... And the attacks on what God has revealed, it just is constant, isn't it? We're, it's like we're pinned down on a battlefield, and the shooting never stops. 
and we can't move. Yeah. This is life in the sinful world. The church militant. But we also know that sometimes the battle isn't just raging from without. We feel it within. Sometimes the attacks come from right in here. This body of death, St. Paul called it, this sin I was born in that, that twists my thoughts and warps my words and my actions and causes me to not do the good things that I would want to do instead, the evil things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. It's sin. This is what sin does to us. And, and just like our first parents, when they fell into sin, we want to run and hide. And we don't want to see God. God wants to see us. He comes and walks in the garden. He wants to see us, but Adam and Eve didn't want to see God. Sin creates fear and doubt and uncertainty because it reminds us of a judgment justly deserved, a judgment of punishment and death from a holy God. And and can we go it on our own without him through life? Oh, yeah, you can put on a pleasant face and pretend everything's okay, but lurking beneath the surface of the skin is gnawing uncertainty and fear. But this is exactly why our Lord Jesus Christ came. The Son of God himself. In that garden, he he loved to walk with the crown of his creation. He loved it, talking with Adam and Eve. And this is what he came to restore so that we could have that again. It cost him everything. Everything. The Father gave his beloved Son into death for our sins. And the Son willingly went. It cost him everything. He came to his own people and his own people rejected him. They wanted nothing to do with him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. The Son of God, familiar with suffering. It cost him everything as he gave his back to the whip and let his hands be stretched out and nailed to a cross. He poured out his blood. He poured out his life. But this is the great burning desire in the heart of God to restore this this bond that we had, this fellowship, so that once again there would be peace through the forgiveness of sins and the payment of guilt. This is what Jesus did on the cross and rose again for our justification. And this is what he gives. He gives it to you. He gives it to you through faith. He gives it to you, not earned, not paid for, it's a gift. The indescribable gift of his grace that we enjoy now and as he designed that we would enjoy it with him forever. And to assure you that this is most certainly true, he has provided this, his meal, where he gives him of himself, his true body and blood, Where is your God? Here he is. Here he is in the supper that he has provided. This is where we come and meet him face to face. And this is where he assures us of his peace and his forgiveness. But can a little wafer and a sip of wine really do all that? Is God here? We just asked in the hymn. You know, those of you who know me know that I'm, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. <laughs> and some of you are too. And in that story, there is this bread that the elves make called Lembus. And just one little bite, one little bite is enough to fill you up and keep you going the whole day. This is more. This is more. Here, heaven touches earth. 
Here the Son of God binds us to himself by giving us his own body and blood. Paul, in our text, says they participate with each other in a way that we cannot see and we cannot taste and we cannot begin to understand. But this is his promise. And as we come to his table, he says, yes, I am with you always. To the very end of the age, he gives us life. The life is in the blood. I know when we think of blood, and the Romans thought this way too about the Christians, that they were cannibals eating flesh and, and drinking blood. They didn't understand. But even with us, we, we're squeamish about blood. We usually associate blood with injury and death. But it, when God commanded all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, he said the life of the animal is in the blood. And it was life that was in the blood of the Passover lamb that the Israelites painted on the door, not death. And when Jesus gives us his body and blood, he is giving us himself and he is giving us life, his life and his promise to be with us to the very end of the age. It's such a beautiful thing. And is this for me? Yes. And we come here to the Lord's table, and as I said, we meet him face to face, and he talks to us as individuals, not as a group that we might get lost in, but he says, this is for you, you, my son, my daughter. This is given for you, my body and my blood. And by that, he reminds us that we are his and he is ours through this wonderful bond he has created by his Holy Spirit. But there is another blessing besides that that Paul talks about in our text. Surely he is with us always as well. And by that now as a group, as a body of believers in Christ who have been gathered by the Holy Spirit around his word and sacrament, Paul speaks about that great blessing too, a blessing that tonight we again are reminded of as we, not just God's children, but certainly that, but also members of this body of Christ we call St. John's, have come together to worship our common Lord. This is a great blessing. And Paul reminds the Corinthians of that because what had happened in Corinth was this. That mission congregation started by Paul had fractured. And all these divisions and little rivalry groups had sprung up, each with their own interests, each with their own members, and each with their own agendas. The unity of the Spirit had been shattered, and Paul called them to repent and strive with the Spirit's help to be of one mind and of one heart, because in God's great design, this is a great blessing that he gives us, the fellowship of believers. And it wasn't just in Corinth, it's still a struggle in every visible church. And I think, candidly, here in America especially, and I say that because it is our great American mindset to emphasize individualism, individuality, and in a visible church, that can be a good thing as we all use our talents and gifts that God has given us, but we can also begin to think of a church family only as a collection of individuals and not a family in Christ. And the larger a congregation is, the greater that this challenge is. And we look around and we see me and the people who go to my church instead of a family in Christ. It's a constant temptation and a constant challenge. But you know, I once met a man, a brother of yours in the faith. Years ago, I gave a seminar up at Calgary in Canada. And he told me his story, you know, 
after we had met, and you could just see joy beaming off of his face. He had belonged to another Christian congregation of a different denomination, and, and they had begun to start to teach things that he disagreed with, and he saw that Scripture disagreed with, and so he left. And he was very disillusioned with the whole idea of church. And so he just sat at his house and read his Bible. A good thing, a good thing. But then he said, you know what? I, I knew all the facts. I knew my Bible. I, I knew I was saved. I never doubted that. But man, I was dying on the vine. He, he just had no support network. And he thought he was an island, which no man is. And he felt so alone. And it really weighed on him. But then he happened to meet our pastor in Calgary. They sat down and they saw that they agreed on what God's word said. And he so much treasured the congregation of believers to which he belonged. He couldn't stop speaking about what a great, great thing that was. Surely, I am with you always. And Jesus' promise is fulfilled too as he calls us together into a visible body of Christ, a body of believers, the members of which he is the head. He has called us to the unity of the Spirit as we gather around word and sacrament. He has given us to each other for support and for encouragement, for help and for prayers to share happiness and sorrows. As a family of believers, we bear witness when we come together as a family and kneel side by side to receive his meal. Remembering his promise that wherever two or three come together in my name, there I am, even to the end of the age. Tonight again, we are reminded of that great blessing on this most holy night, the night our Lord gave us his sacred supper. Here we come, and all differences are laid aside. We come as a family of believers, and some of us are old, and some of us are young, and some of us have really good, stable jobs, and, and some of us are struggling. And some of us are men, and some of us are women. Some of us have been lifelong members of this congregation, and some of us are new to it or even new to the faith. Some of us are in the public school system. Some of us are in the Lutheran school system. Some of us are lay members of the congregation, and a bit unique to our situation, some of us are called workers in the gospel ministry. But here, all those differences disappear as we kneel side by side as a family gathered around the table and we receive the same bread and the same wine. We receive the same Lord. And we get up from this table thankful not only for his grace to us as individuals, but for this blessing of giving us fellow travelers fellow Christians to walk with on our journey home. You know, when I drink a can of soda, it's rare, but I do, but when I drink a can of soda, I look at the label and it says that there's phosphoric acid in it. I can't see it. I can't taste it. But it must be there. The label says it is. Where is your God? I can't see him. I can't taste him. But he must be here. His word says he is. Surely, I am with you to the very end of the age. A promise and a blessing to be received by faith, not by sight. And God richly blesses the faith that accepts it as so, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all your understanding and mine, 
keep our hearts through faith in our Lord Jesus unto eternal life. Amen. We now continue with the Confession of Faith on page 8. What is the sacrament of Holy Communion? What blessing do we receive through this eating and drinking? How can eating and drinking do such great things? Who then is properly prepared to receive this sacrament? This Lenten season, we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering which led him to the cross for our salvation. We also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to amend our lives continue with us because his love for us in Jesus, our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. 
In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt, but firmly believe that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven. For it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness and participate in that new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we shall share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the joyous culmination of our reconciliation with God and each other. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who willingly died under the curse of this world's sin, so that we may live forever in the light of God's blessing. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord, because you have brought us from death to life. Humble, or with humble and repentant hearts, we praise and thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who, came, who became our substitute under your holy law, who destroyed the works of the devil by his perfect obedience to your will, who willingly carried a cross to pay the debt of the world's sin who lives and reigns to give us life. Through his body and blood, once given and poured out for us, forgive our sins and strengthen us for our journey heavenward. Unite us to our crucified and risen Lord, that we may believe in him, confess him, call on his name, and finally be delivered from this world to the feast of the Lamb, whose kingdom has no end. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your people. Until the day when you receive us as your heavenly guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. have 
taken my companions and loved ones from 